الله أكبر الله أكبر الله servitude to Allah, uh, God, um, it's basically implementing a way of life that God has prescribed for us um, and having a relationship with Him. My family basically said, come home, but don't be Muslim. So I decided just to stay here. Jamaica, when the slave was brought to Jamaica, there were Muslims. But because of the colonialism, um, that was taken away from them. The most in praying five times a day is extremism. You know, for a woman to wear hijab is extreme in their point of view. That was one of the questions I had. I was to say to Allah, please guide me to your true religion so I know how to worship you properly. My name is Julian Gray and I'm a professional football player. I remember being when I was young, my mum obviously told me the first steps I ever took was to stand up and walk to kick a football. So obviously I think from the early stages of my childhood, I always wanted to play football and I loved my football and everywhere I went, my football went with me. When well, obviously I touched on Islam, maybe in 2001, 2002, because my brother reverted to Islam and obviously he was the only one in the family at the time that did and he was went to holiday in Jamaica, I was injured at the time, I had an operation so I was recuperating and went to Jamaica to see family and rest and he had some books and he, which he gave me on Islam and that was my first obviously insight into it, I read those books, was intrigued obviously to find out who the one true God. My name's Will, short for William. Uh, I'm 19 years old and I'm a social science student at the University of Birmingham. When I was little, um, I went to uh, an infant school and a primary school called uh, St. Lawrence Church of England School. So it was an Anglican school. Um, and it was basically just a normal school apart from it was a faith school. So they did do things like... Um, you know, assemblies where they'd bring in, um, like a, they called him Father Robert. He's basically like a priest. They'd bring him in. He would tell us biblical stories and things like that. We would sing hymns. We would go to church every now and again. So it was a faith school. And, you know, we just did the normal things that, that sort of you do at a Christian school. I was never attracted to Islam to begin with. I think the thing that um, drew me to want to learn about it was the fact that it was so potently sort of different. Um, obviously, every sort of religious tradition has their own distinctive or the followers of it have distinctive features and things like that. So with the Muslims, that is, you see people who are, um, you know, wearing thobes or wearing hijab or something like this. So that's the thing that sort of made me think, why are they different? I was born in Canada, a small town outside of Toronto. Um, the town was pretty, pretty much all white people, not a lot of different cultures, not a lot of different religions, um, so I didn't have that much exposure. I was raised with no religion. Um, my mom is from a Christian background, so her parents are practicing. My dad is from a Roman Catholic background. So his parents were practicing, but neither of my parents were. And um, I think at a very young age, I realized that religion was, a, was taboo in our home. And it wasn't something that was to be talked about. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't acceptable. I remember at one point when I was studying religious philosophy, I looked into every different religion. But I was so afraid to Google Islam in case it was seen on my history. <laughs> So 
Yeah, I think it, it deterred me a little bit. My name's uh, Dawood Mannion. Uh, I was born as uh, David Mannion. I've uh, been Muslim for uh, nearly 12 years. For several years I've, uh, in my spare time, and now, uh, you know, as a uh, full-time, I've uh, been calling people to Islam. Uh, you know, running uh, stalls, uh, educational stalls uh, in the city centre, uh, first in Sheffield and now here in Leicester. So we uh, get a lot of people, they ask, want to ask questions about Islam, or we will ask them, you know, what do you think your purpose in life is? Try and in initiate a conversation in a very sort of like, polite uh, way. Did God become man? Because how can the unlimited, all-powerful, yeah, yeah, become limited? Okay, but is, is Jesus God? Okay, the, so is God all-knowing? Is God all-powerful? Is Jesus all-knowing? No. Jesus yeah. himself in the Bible says, as of myself, as I'm asking the hour, he says, I do not know the hour. Okay, but Jesus himself says, I do not know the hour. Only the Father above knows the hour. So he wasn't all knowing, was he? So you said one of the traits of divinity was being all knowing. We agreed upon that. And I asked you if Jesus was all knowing. But according to your Bible, Jesus was not all knowing. I was actually raised as a atheist. Uh, my father's an atheist, or was an atheist. My mother uh, was a uh, lapsed uh, Methodist Christian. So she, you know, had some beliefs about some creator, but she kept it to herself. Uh, but I was actually raised as an atheist. I was raised to believe there was no creator at all. I obviously was on holiday in LA and had been in a nightclub with my friends. Obviously, they were drinking. and I wasn't really a drinker, heavy drinker. I was there was partying and I'm just sitting down on the sofas watching them and it's like saying to myself what what am I doing here so I ended up leaving going back to my hotel on my own obviously phoned my wife who was my girlfriend at the time obviously because I wasn't practicing then and said to her look I need to when I come back to England I need to get closer to God there's this is what's missing in my life I need that closeness to God I remember it like it was yesterday <laughs> Alhamdulillah, and I said, obviously, she told me about a guy, his name's Wally, who reverted to Islam many years ago, but she obviously came into contact with him in the place that she was working. I was actually I was studying uh, an applied biology degree at the time. You know, from looking down the microscope, looking at all the organisms, and, you know, walking out in the countryside, especially at night time. I used to love walking at night time. You, know, you look up at all the stars, and it doesn't make sense that there is uh, no creator. It made no rational sense. It started to really grate on me that I couldn't uh, think uh, my way around this problem. Why, why is it all this stuff here? You know, how can it come by accident? Uh, so I became a believer in a creator. Uh, you know, I left my atheism and became at least a believer in something. When I spoke to my friends in college, and I, to be honest with you, I started asking them very kind of uh, sort of harsh questions. Things like, oh, is it true that Muslims, um, you know, stone people and stuff like this? It was kind of like difficult questions to grasp if you're somebody who hasn't studied the religion. And so I was asking them these kind of questions. And, you know, fair enough, they basically said, look, um, we don't we don't know the actual real answers to these questions. We know there are answers, but we don't personally know the right answers. Can we take you to people who can explain? And I was like, OK, fine. So they took me to um, this dower stand in the city centre every Saturday. Um, a group of a group of guys basically have uh, like a stand where they have lots of literature and they can just basically educate people about the religion, really. So they took me to them and I fired a few of these kind of hard questions at them. After that, um, I decided that I wanted to do further research because one thing I found interesting was that I could ask sort of, you could say, hostile questions and they were able to actually give satisfactory sort of answers or they'd make me look at a certain issue in a totally different way. And it sort of opened my eyes to the idea that um, there are different sort of perspectives on life and there's different ways you can live your life. He left me with a few DVDs and some books. I started searching more reading them and alhamdulillah we kept in contact ramadan came in and he took me to the mosque during ramadan 
obviously the first time I've gone to the mosque and all these strange people are greeting me, hugging me and saying, so relate, and hugging me and embracing me and showing me all this love. And I'm like, wow, I've not experienced that before from strange people, you know? And obviously we was praying, finished praying. And then when we left the mosque, I felt really good. Went back a couple of other times with him to the masjid. Same thing. Every time I went, same reaction. And the, uh, these Muslims at work and their fa- some of their families, they offered to give me a translation of the Quran to read. So I thought I'd be able to read this like the Bible. I thought it was going to be just like the Bible. Yeah, I'll take what's good. If there's anything new I've, I've not got there, and I'll leave everything else. However, when I started to read the Quran in translation, it, uh, it was an entirely different book. When I read it, I couldn't find the, the logical inconsistencies, you know, the flaws in it, like you can with the Bible. And that was obviously, you know, quite a shock to me, because I thought this was going to be a book just like the Bible. And in fact, the book was uh, totally different. Bismillahi Rahmani Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Rahim Maliki Yawun Bidin Iya kanabuz wa iya kanastain In the rasrul pal mustaqim Sarat falani naram talahim Wa ni ma dudi alahim wa lafka alim Amen Coming from a Christian background I've been brought up as a very at an early age um, I found there's a lot of similarities with Christian and uh, Muslim. But one of the things that strikes me more, uh, for me it was a spiritual thing, I, for me it was a spiritual thing, there was a bit more more guidance, things that you should do to follow the five pillars, etc. Um, your daily, how you should live your daily life amongst your, your fellow man. I just felt that it was more of a structured thing, there was more information that I could read and get that guidance, that that teaching. Over my kind of year period of research, I had kind of ups and downs. There were some times where where I would kind of like read certain things and I'd get really kind of, I'd I'd think, you know, there there must be something to this. There must be something behind this. And I'd actually start thinking, you know, maybe Islam is true. And then there'd be other times where I would perhaps read something else or I just wasn't kind of feeling it. I would, I would be thinking, actually, I'm not sure. I don't know about this. And there was kind of ups and downs over this year period. Um, and eventually I got to, oh, during this year, towards the end of it, I got to a point actually where I decided, you know what? I don't know. I just don't want to. I, I think I got overwhelmed, I think, intellectually, and I just kind of pushed it all away. And for a while, I stopped doing my research. Um, but then there came a point where... Um, I went back to it and I started watching um, a new, uh, I guess, speaker um, who, you, who his, his style of uh, lectures appealed to me quite a lot because they were very, very kind of intellectual, philosophical sort of stuff. The speaker that I really like was coming to do a talk at Aston University. So I thought, you know what, after I've watched that speech, I'll be really, really kind of inspired and everything. And that will be enough for me to just go with it and just accept Islam then. So I thought, okay, I'll do that. So I planned it all out. I, I, I was going to go to the lecture and after the lecture, take Shahada. And from that day forward, I was going to try my best to implement everything and learn as much as possible and so on. And just be Muslim from that point forward. I couldn't get my head around the concept of God. And, or, and they would say, it was confusing. Jesus is the son of God. And at that time, Jesus is God. So there's a contradiction there. And the same, the free, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. This goes against the first commandment. So for me, Islam obviously puts that. It's the same as what the first commandment is to not worship God. I mean, to worship God alone and not to associate a partner with him. And that's Islam. And I pray to God, direct to God. I don't go through somebody. Like through Jesus, I don't, do you understand? I go, it's just between me and God, and that's how it should be.
one of the key aspects is that God is is indiscreet. So you can't separate God into parts. And that is why he's totally different from the creation. That's why, because the creation, everything in the creation, you can break down into different parts. You could take one human being, but say, actually, this human being is a collection of organs and limbs. You could take one organ and say, this is one stomach, but actually it's made up of the stomach lining and muscle and whatever. So everything in the creation, you can break down into different bits. When it comes to Allah, you can't do that at all, which is the whole meaning of Al-Ahad, one of his names. Uh, something which is so uniquely sort of singular one. I became a Muslim in 2010, um, right before Ramadan. And it started with me just hearing some Arab people speaking at school and they were hearing the Arabic and I was fascinated by it. So I asked them um, what language they were speaking. And then when they told me it was Arabic, I asked if they were Muslim. Um, and I just kept asking them questions. Eventually, I was given a number of a woman who gave me, who would give me Tawheed lessons, so about oneness of Allah. And it took me a while to contact her, but eventually I did. And um, I, I took lessons for three months with her, and I ended up taking my Shahada, alhamdulillah. I didn't go to her wanting to accept any religion. I went to her because I didn't want to be ignorant because I knew, like I heard people speaking Arabic. I knew they were Muslim and they're around me. So I wanted to know what, what happens in their life. There's a saying of one of the scholars that say that if you want to speak to Allah, pray Salah. If you want Allah to speak to you, read the Quran. When you read the Quran, it is, uh, a lot of people say this, that it seems as though it was written just for them. As in, everything they're reading can be applied to them somehow, or the way they, they, they can perceive it in a way that applies to them. Uh, a lot of people say this. So when I've, I've gone through the book uh, again, reading through the Quran again, and I'm fasting, and at the same time, uh, there's somebody I, I met on the internet who came from a nearby city called Sheffield, and he was said, uh, well, it's in the Ramadan, there's no better time to visit the, the mosque and find out about Islam. So we went to the, to the mosque, uh, which is uh, Masjid Umar in uh, Sheffield. And it was obviously Tarawih Salah, everyone's rushing in. Uh, they're all, you know, as we got there, they're just about to pray Isha. So I sat at the back uh, because I didn't know what I was doing. And then after Isha Salah, uh, the Imam invited me to the front of the masjid. I said, my shahada. Uh, and then everyone's, you know, also starts giving takbir, and you know, this mostly, mostly this masjid is full of Pashtuns as well. So huge guys giving me massive hugs, and I thought they're going to break my ribs. Uh, but obviously, it was, you know, like it was like the most amazing feeling. Uh, to it felt like, you know, everything had been lifted off my shoulders. He says, "Alhamdulillah, you, you take you." Praying five times a day, he says, but you've missed a step. You need to take your shahada. That's the first step. He said, do you believe in, in Allah and that he's alone to be worshipped and stuff? I said, yeah, of course I do. I say, do you believe in Prophet Muhammad? I said, yeah, alhamdulillah. He said, okay, well then if we just need to confirm that with your tongue now and what's in your heart. So I to testify that, I said, okay, my wife, obviously my partner at the time, she wanted to take her shahada because she had been practicing obviously learning to pray just like me so she said I'm ready to take my shahada so then when I actually did take shahada it was like a relief that ah oh, I'm I'm now my, my kind of like lifestyle how I want to live and what what I believe is true and so on my convictions are now in synthesis so that's why it was like a relief it's I don't know if I can find the right words but there is a kind of like, yes, this is, I want to be, I want to be a Muslim. It was a kind of spiritual feeling that came when I sat there um, and took that out. I ended up leaving home um, and 
at one point I went back um, on the condition that I didn't do anything Muslim or wear a headscarf or show any sign of being Muslim, but they would see, I would sometimes forget to put my prayer mat away. My hair would be flat when I came home because I had my headscarf on and take it off in the garage. And it just got too hard. Um, There's a lot of conflict, so I left again. And really, like, still to this day, there's some members of my family who don't talk to me, but my parents are coming around, alhamdulillah. I decided I wanted to get married, um, so I was introduced to a scholar who lived in the UK. Um, we got married, and I moved over here, and that's when I learned the hard way that not all Muslims, no matter how much knowledge they have, they're not all made of gold. Um, so I ended up in the UK now on indefinite leave to remain on basis of domestic violence. So. Um, that's how I ended up here. Unfortunately, a lot of new Muslims do rush into marriage very soon after they said their shahada. Uh, and this leads to, you know, problems of divorce or marrying to the totally wrong person. Because when you're a new Muslim, everybody's, or everybody's Muslim, it doesn't matter. But then later on you find out there's, you know, some quite glaringly big differences. So the person you are when you and the understanding of Islam when you first become Muslim is going to be very different a year or two years later. So it's sometimes better that they wait a year or two before they even think about marriage. Walking on the street, whether I've got Islam or not, to show that I'm Muslim or Muslim, and I say, Salaamu Alaikum, it's always return. Today I was walking through the city centre of Birmingham, and Muslim brothers are there with the books and they're preaching, and I walk past and I say, Salaamu Alaikum, and you get the return. So there's a bit, there's a lot more together. There's no problem um, within the Muslim community. The sisters that I do meet are a lot more welcoming and they literally treat me like their family. I was, I was in London one time and I was looking for a mosque and I was a bit lost and I stopped a sister and asked her and she said, the mosque is far, just come to my home and pray. And then on the way out, I needed directions back to the train station and another sister walked me to the train station. And it was just, subhanAllah, I think there's a lot of support between the Muslims here, at least the ones that I've met. Togetherness. Because you have to play as a team, the winning, the enjoyment factor is my passion. And for me, this is where I get my enjoyment and I can express myself. It's been a massive part of my life for a long time, you know. So always when you're out on the grass and with the ball, it brings back memories and you just want to be at, this is where I want to be. The clubs of that I've been at have been very open and helpful to assist me in every form of my religion. Obviously when they get halal meat for me or I say if they no no problem can I have fish when it's meal time and stuff, they cater for me in that respect. The respect that I've got to pray and that I'm fasting. Fasting is not a problem for me. I do it easily. Ramadan did get hard, though, uh, when you're living on your own. Um, Mashallah, my friends were there, and like a lot of them invited me to their homes and had iftar with me. But at the end of the day, they have their family, and you will go home. Um, so there are a lot of nights when I was breaking fast alone, and it's astaghfirullah. There were times when I got like when I got really down. Um, I just had to remind myself of people who who had less, who didn't, whose family isn't even alive, subhanAllah. So, um, yeah, it, that was the biggest challenge in Ramadan. You're listening to 93.5 Unity FM, the heart of the city. Dear listeners, thank you very much for tuning in. And as you know, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of billionaires in the world. You know, we've got this issue where 
wealth is being concentrated on a global scale. We've had complaints um, from reverts living in places outside the city that, you know, there's nothing for them in terms of there's no masajids, they don't know any Muslims living there, nothing. So they feel a bit isolated and so on. Um, so they were basically asking if there could be something tailored uh, for them on the radio. So he came to me and he said, um, we've had this complaint. Would you like to make a show tailored towards sort of uh, reverts or, you know, people who um, perhaps uh, are living in places where there's not much, you could say, Muslim infrastructure, if you like? Um, so I said, OK, fine, I'll, I'll give it a go. In this country, most of the big kind of newspapers and things like that are owned by fairly extreme right wing sort of organizations or people with right wing ideologies. So there's automatically going to be a bias there in terms of reverts becoming uh, extremist. First of all, what is extremism? Because I would say that we're living in a society right now where there's all sorts of different types of extremism going on. There's extremism in eating going on. There's extremism in sexual desires going on. There's all sorts of different extremisms going on. So extremism is is a broader problem. So for them to pick out this one sort of religious extremism, they say, as an issue in itself or as a kind of separate issue or whatever, they're ignoring the fact that we're in a civilizational crisis at the moment where we're just totally out of balance. We're extreme in everything nowadays. As Allah says in the Quran, that he says, for what your father has done, your son, the son will not be punished and vice versa. So if I make a, do a mistake, it's not, it's not on my parent or the person who I'm with. I've made that mistake. It's on me because I'm in control of my actions. So this is how we should view people in general, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. If someone makes a mistake, they've made a mistake or done something incorrect. It, it's down to that person. You can't say it's because he's black or it's because he's white. You don't, it, it's not about this, it. the individual. And this is, I think, society tends to blame something else. It makes it easier to associate a bad thing with something else. It's dangerous. I mean, we've obviously seen recently people have been killed. Uh, so I think a lot of the media, they have blood on their hands. Because they they think that, you know, what does it matter if we attack these people, we cause, you know, hatred against them, yeah? They don't see it as a big issue. It sells newspapers. At the moment, you know, the Muslims are the, the biggest sellers selling uh, matter for newspapers. You know, either it's attacking Islam or, you know, it's saying this about them or this about them or this uh, current affairs event taking off on the or, or side of the world. Oh, it's, it's attacking Muslims. So it, may, it makes a lot of money for them. But I think reverts perhaps as a wider role that they could play in the media, they could kind of bridge the gap between the Muslim community and the, the rest of society uh, who don't really understand the Muslim community. They could bridge that gap because they've kind of got a foot in both uh, camps, if you like, because they've come from that cultural context and so on. They understand it perhaps better than some other Muslims, um, but also they understand Islam as well. And a lot of reverts have a good understanding because they've done thorough research and things like that. So I think the function they could play in the media is on bringing the Muslim community and the wider community together and educating people and dispelling misconceptions and things like that.